Welcome to Upthinking Finance, a podcast that offers a unique and discerning view of economics and financial planning. Here is your host, Emerson Fersh. Welcome to another episode of Upthinking Finance. Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises once said, freedom is indivisible. As soon as one starts to restrict it, one enters upon a decline on which it is difficult to stop. Now, for those of you who are listening, I'm going to ask you later to go to a website called usdebtclock.org. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube, you're probably already familiar with this, but I want to just start the uh, the uh, podcast today by taking a look at this. Now, you can see it's like a giant calculator with a bunch of numbers, and a lot of them are in red, which usually doesn't mean uh, that's not a positive thing. And you can see that the, the main one on the left I want to spend time on is the U.S. national debt, which currently sits at $30 trillion, and you can see it just continually goes up. Uh, in fact, I figured it out. In the time it takes me to take a breath, that number increases anywhere from maybe sixty to $75,000, which I guess is just the interest that continues to accumulate on this debt. Now, some of you may remember that movie, The Matrix, you know, when Morpheus sits down with Neo and he's got his palms open with the two pills, the red pill and the blue pill. And the blue pill is kind of, you just keep going on with your life and, you know, ignorance is bliss. And then the red pill is the one that opens up sort of the uh, door to uh, the awareness. And I think Morpheus says something along the lines of you get to go down and see just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Well, I pretty much was the blue pill guy for a number of years when people would ask me, you know, well, what about... You know, what What about the U.S. Uh, de debt? And I'd say, well, you know, what about it? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, when I got licensed, securities licensed the first time, the Dow was around 3,800. And today, as we sit here in, uh, you know, July of uh, 2022, um, you know, it's over 30,000. So the debt didn't matter, at least to the type of people I was dealing with. Um, but this debt has caused a lot of problems. And so when the United States went off of the gold standard back in 1971, what that effectively allowed the government to do was to print money as much as they wanted. A, a gold-backed currency back system, for those of you who don't know, just simply means you can only issue as much money as you have gold or, you know, in some whatever other asset there is to back it. There's a limit, which also affixes a value. We are on what's called a fiat money system now. What that simply means is, is the market forces dictate um, the value of the currency. And, of course, as Russell Napier in a previous episode explained, um, those values can be easily manipulated. And so what has also happened over the years is you, uh, the wealth disparity. And what that means is simply the, the people that can afford to borrow and accumulate assets get wealthier uh, and as a result, you know, we live in a world now, at least in the United States, where about 30 percent of the assets are controlled by one percent of the population. And the lower 50 percent of the population only control about six percent. So you have this huge gap that's formed. And there's other consequences that have resulted since uh, 1971. Um, productivity's increased, wages have not kept up. And so that's where we find ourselves today. And so the question really is, is how do we get here? And where is this headed? Because I don't think anybody that's got, you know, even a, a modicum of, of rationality can tell, would be convinced that they that this $30 trillion and probably over 31 by the time this airs um, is ever going to get paid off. You know, there is a point where there's a reckoning. And now that interest rates have started going up, uh, that appears that day, I feel like, is is pretty much on our doorstep. So today's guest is an expert on what has been referred to as the Great Reset. Uh, and I've read a lot of articles. There's a lot of people that speak about this. He's probably, in my opinion, certainly the most educated and really the most level-headed. And so today's guest is Professor Michael Rechtenwald. Um, he's authored 11 books, including titles such as Thought Criminal, published in 2020, Google Archipelago, which was published in 2019, and 19th Century British Secularism, which was published in 2016. Uh, he worked as a professor at New York University for 11 years from 2008 until 2019. And he is considered a pundit and champion of free speech against all forms of authoritarianism, totalitarianism, and particularly political correctness. So he and I are kindred, kindred spirits in that regard. Um, Professor Rechtenwald has appeared on a number of mainstream network talk shows, on syndicated radio shows, and does uh, frequent interviews on YouTube channels and podcasts. 
I found him by way of his 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 essays, and he's published his academic and scholarly essays, scholarly essays have appeared in a number of publications, including the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, Academic Questions, Endeavor, the British Journal for the History of Science, International Philosophical Quarterly, and um, the Hillsdale College Monthly Speech Digest called Imprimis. He is also a regular contributor to the uh, economic education organization, the Mises Institute, which is how I became acquainted with him. So it's my pleasure to welcome live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Professor Michael Rechtenwald. Professor, thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I thought the best place to start would be if you could explain for anybody who's not familiar or maybe is familiar with the term Great Reset but really doesn't know what it means, what exactly does that refer to? Yeah, the Great Reset is a package of um, plans uh, that refers to the World Economic Forum's uh, agenda to reset capitalism uh, from so-called shareholder capitalism uh, to stakeholder capitalism. Um, and that is, on the economic front, that's what it represents, stakeholder capitalism being uh, a system that not only considers shareholders in the operations of corporations, but also uh, so-called stakeholders who are basically the customers, workers, uh, the community, society at large, the global community, etc. So no longer, according to uh, Klaus Schwab, the uh, founder and chair of the World Economic Forum, no longer should the free market be operative, that we must uh, counter what he calls neoliberalism, which is just a stand-in for free market capitalism, that must be uh, overthrown and replaced with this stakeholder capitalism. Uh, and uh, from there, all kinds of things uh, emerge. Is there, are there roots? I mean, I, I've, you know, where this all started, I mean, some will say this, you know, goes back to the basic battle between good and evil that you can read about in the Bible. Um, you know, I've got my own theory that I, I feel like perhaps it has its roots in the third iteration of the, the Federal Reserve in 1913. Um, you know, I had a guest on, Russell Napier. You may be familiar with him. He's an economist over there in, in Scotland. He, you know, kind of, I, at least from our conversation, it sort of starts with the, the burge of the eighth of debt, the age of debt, which came out of the Asian financial crisis. And instead of, you know, learning from the dangers of leverage, it just became, you know, something that was abused. Um, and then there's, you know, the gold standard, you know, the change in the gold standard in 1971. So curious in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely a connection to the banking industry. Uh, and in particular, the, um, you know, the, the repudiation of uh, Breton Woods and um, the, of course, ca you know, asset less based banking, uh, simply fiat currency. Uh, and the enormous debt that's accrued on the basis of this, uh, effectively, you know, the the unrestrained printing of money is certainly uh, a big factor here. Uh, some would argue that the, that the Great Reset is a means by which uh, the elite may recoup their debt uh, by uh, staving off and starving off uh, certain uh, populations from uh, their consumption patterns and standards of living. Um, I think it is, uh, it really stems uh, also from the climate industrial complex uh, and the whole uh, green movement and, uh, you know, the global warming catastrophism that has been uh, basically in place since 1971. Um, and uh, these uh, climate catastrophists have been uh, making their way into business, uh, into businesses, into corporations, into banks, into asset managers uh, for some time now. And so now they have a very firm grip on the economic levers. Uh, this is no longer some grassroots movement. They have a firm grip on the economic levers uh, and they're entrenched, deeply entrenched, in uh, all of the major corporations and asset managers and banks, uh, frankly. A couple of thoughts come to mind. I mean, so would you say, because when I think about this, it seems like this stakeholder capitalism 
is really a way for uh, these corporations to subvert the will of the people. And now you have the corporations that are impacting the decisions of government rather than, you know, the voter. Is, I mean, is that a simple way to put it? That's, that's one aspect of what takes place because what this is is a kind of extra governmental or pre-governmental uh, arrangement whereby uh, instead of passing legislation to enforce uh, climate policies, the corporations and the banks and asset managers are leading the way and they're basically, uh, they're not precluding or preempting uh, legislation. They're, they're effectively getting out in, in, in front of it. Uh, they are uh, effectively pushing this agenda so that then the legislation will follow and they'll, they'll already be compliant. Uh, so they'll be uh, compliant before any legislation, which would probably less, be less restringent than the actual um, stakeholder um, metrics that are being applied are. Uh, that is to say, these, these companies are, pre, you know, they're, pre, they're, they're previewing, uh, they're previewing and actually advancing this agenda uh, without legislative uh, bodies uh, voting on anything. And in fact, it really is a an undemocratic process, especially in terms of shareholders, but also employees, customers, everybody, because all these costs will increase enormously based on these practices. Uh, this is a, as Milton Friedman put it, this is just a, a way of, it's a very undemocratic process whereby the social responsibility of the corporation comes before anything else, and this represents a tax, in effect, on, on everybody concerned. Which we're seeing manifest itself now. Um, so, and, and you made a, a, a good point, you know, about the, the, these companies um, abusing, it sounded like, you know, my own words, but abusing their responsibility in a sense to shareholders. And this comes through, I read something um, about proxy votes and how like BlackRock is probably one of the biggest um, uh, offenders, I suppose you'd say. I mean, they're like, what, $10 trillion company. They have all these passive ETF investments that are tied to indexes, but they're using their shareholder clout, like Vanguard, to influence and force these companies to do things. I mean, is that... That's absolutely true. And, and they're actually smuggling ESG uh, scored companies into their major portfolios in order to bolster the performance of the ES ESG abiding uh abiding uh, stocks uh, such that they basically inflate the value of these ESG uh, uh, indexed uh, companies. Uh, this is one way that they're doing this. They're, they're smuggling this in. Uh, and of course, your, your listeners will know what ESG stands for, which is environmental, social, and governance scores. Uh, the index, uh, which is being used and applied to major corporations and Basically, the stock market, I think it's going to be utterly and totally universalized and made, uh, wor you know, completely uh, global and uh, probably mandatory in, in the near future. Could I ask you to explain, because, again, believe it or not, <laughs> I know you're immersed in this and I, I know enough to be dangerous, but not everybody knows what e not everybody knows what ESG is. Do you mind just kind of elaborating on that whole idea? The ESG index is the mechanism by which stakeholder capitalism is being implemented. And E stands for environmental, S stands for social, and G stands for governance. So the environmental score is basically determined on, on the basis of how well do the, does the uh, does the company abide by uh, sustainability measures. Um, that is, do they have a net zero plan? Uh, do they have, uh, uh, are they looking at reducing their carbon footprint? Um, and uh, are they uh, otherwise environmentally sound or unsound? And um, that's supposedly what it means. I'll go into some of the problems with this later if you want. <clears throat> the social stands for social governance, uh, I'm social justice, I would say, really. It is a social justice index that really is about how well is your company uh, represented by minorities and uh, of all types, gender, sexual, 
orientation, uh, uh, racial minorities, uh, and, and so forth. So this is really, they're scoring companies on their diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, metrics. It sounds like affirmative action on steroids. It's, it's affirmative action now being implemented through the stock exchange. It's incredible. Then governance, it has to do with, you know, uh, the human rights uh, qualifications of a, of a corporation. Also, I think, complicity or their compliance with the government, with the state. How well do they abide by state dictates? And, you might say, how well do they enforce or even parrot official state narratives. So, okay, now I'm sure there are some who would hear all this and think, well, geez, you know, environmental and... What's the problem? Yeah, right, what's so bad about it? First of all, without adjudicating the climate science, which I could talk about a little bit later, what this represents is a cartelization scheme, a kind of monopoly scheme, whereby compliant companies are basically fed capital while the non-compliant are essentially starved of capital investment. This goes from not only asset managers, but also banks. So it's a way of establishing a cartel. I call it the woke cartel, because in every way it represents how well do they abide by woke dictates. And so it is extremely authoritarian, and some would say totalitarian, in the sense that it is it abrogates property rights by virtue of the fact that it demands that you can't do with your own company what you wish. You must abide by these dictates and pressures and you must conform. You must behave as we wish or you will not get investments. You will not, get, you will not be in portfolios. You'll be left behind. Uh, this was said very clearly in the recent uh, WEF annual meeting 2022 in May, uh, Moynihan, the CEO of uh, Bank of America, said basically, if you don't meet the certain bar, a stakeholder bar, an ESG uh, bar, you will not get loans. You will not get capital investment. I mean, it's that clear. So it's a, I think it's a cartel scheme. So it's a cartel scheme to to demarcate the woke from the unwoke, to starve the, the latter out of capital investments, and effectively to monopolize the market by virtue of driving competitors out of the system. It, it's almost like the compliant versus the non-compliant. And so this is where, okay, I know this is going to sound really out of left field. So I, I got this thing where I started uh, binge watching old episodes of Adam 12. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I grew up in Southern California, and so San Fernando Valley, and that's where they filmed that show. And so I was getting a little nostalgic. You know, we, we moved about a year and a half ago out of California. And so I'm watching these shows, and I'm kind of looking for, like, things that might look familiar, you know. Cause, and one of the things I noticed was that in the scenes, it's, there's all these small businesses. You don't see, like, the Home Depots. You might see a gas station or something. But And and now you think about it today in and, and small business, which are the ones who can – act independently. I mean, I know I've run my company for 30 years and it's just four employees at this point. I mean, we're tiny, but, you know, I'm able to circumvent a lot of these mandates, you know, they keep coming down, particularly in California when I was based there. Um, but I think that's a threat that I'm guessing, and maybe this leads to another point. How do all this subtly, because truthfully, I don't even remember the great term, great reset. I mean, that's like kind of a new thing, at least to me, in the last couple of years. ESG is certainly, you know, fairly recent. But clearly, like you said, this has roots at least back to 71. How does all this stuff happen to get to a point now where we're, you know, $30 trillion in debt, where, you know, we've got this wealth disparity, all these consequences of all that? I mean, how did, how did this happen under our nose? Were we all just so happy going on with our lives and, you know, living that we just didn't care? Okay, so really what happened is we have... 50 to 60 years of climate activism uh, that very early on um, penetrated uh, major institutions and not simply, it didn't simply come from some grassroots movement. We had an early introduction uh, of climate catastrophism to corporations, um, and corporations adopted this uh, 
belief that you know CO2 emissions, and first it was uh, sulfur, sulfur dioxide, they thought was causing acid rain. And then right on the heels of the acid rain movement, uh, they drove the climate change or global warming uh, movement into the consideration of corporate boardrooms. And um, it became a sweeping but incremental process uh, by which these uh, precepts were adopted, and uh, then they've become, over you know, uh, the last 20-some uh, some years, they've been institutionalized to the point where we now have an ESG score and we have a, an official doctrine of state, stakeholder capitalism that is embraced by almost all the world's major corporations and banks and asset managers. So it was incremental, but... Uh, we didn't notice it was happening until the the water grew so high that the dam burst, and, and here we are. Okay, now I've had, because <clears throat> this is where that conspiracy word comes in for some, and I've had people that will say, you know, it, it would be too difficult to coordinate this global effort. And I think this is where you go back to the World Economic Forum. I mean, I think, it, although I guess What's his, uh, who's the guy? Boris Johnson's out. But it, there was a point where all the G7 leaders were all, what, disciples of uh, the Klaus Schwab movement in one form or fashion. Um, so that's, I guess that would be my thing is, is, is maybe the question is, is this is, um, you know, how do you, how do you get somebody to, if you're to, if somebody were to say, you know, this sounds like an extreme group or as you mentioned, grassroots effort, you know, people that, yeah, they've got wacky ideas, but um, and yeah, there's this ESG stuff going on, but somehow don't either unwilling to or unable to connect this stuff to something that's an actual threat. You know, what do you offer a person, you know what I'm saying, who's just not really able to take that leap? Sure. Well, the first thing I would say is visit the WEF's website and look, search for their corporate partners and look at the list of corporate partners that are completely pledged to the mission. This, is, this reads like a who's who of corporate America and world corporate uh, domination. We're talking about everything in China and uh, the United States and Europe. All, all these major corporations and banks are partners with the WEF. So that's how they've coordinated. They've enlisted these partners uh, into the process and drew the, drawn them in uh, to the practices that they're implementing. Why would... A, a company, a wealth management company that exists ostensibly for the, the purpose of helping investors, you know, the retail people I deal with build wealth, support an organization and affiliate with one who has a stated mission they'll own nothing by 2030 and be happy. What this means is you'll own nothing and be happy, but this is only because the production and distribution of goods will be controlled by a particular woke cartel who will own everything and be very happy uh, because this is a means this is a means of driving out competitors this is why they're enrolled and they want to have the first mover advantage of being on in the front of this and so once you get this ball rolling and you get these people that are trying to be the first movers who then take advantage of this market, uh, then you, you, you start to drive all the competition either out or in. And so it's just collected this enormous, uh, uh, it's, it's got this enormous momentum going now, and it's really uh, almost unstoppable. Uh, so we're looking at um, a, a, an enlistment process, enrolling these allies into this, creed and then getting them to adopt various practices uh, along ESG lines and along other stakeholder uh, lines. The uh, World Economic Forum has their own stakeholder uh, criteria or metrics that their, comp that the, their partners uh, have signed on to. Then the UN is a huge player here. The UN has uh, the principles for responsible investment and these principles are utterly and totally about ESG. If there's six principles of responsible investment, every one of them reads like, we will do this, we will do that, we will do this, 
We will abide by ESGs. We will make sure our customers abide by ESGs. We will try to preach the ESG gospel wherever we go. Uh, we'll cooperate with our competitors in order to push the ESG scores. Uh, so this is a this this there's 4,700 signatories to the principles for, for responsible investment. These include all of the world's major asset manager, managers, all, almost all the major asset holders, and ser asset service managers, and other types of uh, businesses I really don't know much about, but the, effectively this is like the entire financial community. This, this is so widespread uh, it, it's unbelievable. And, and I think, and I'm glad you brought up the website because that's sort of my filter now. <laughs> Anytime anybody emails me or calls me, that's the first thing I check. Who am I dealing with? And I know, you know, in the, in the, the world of financial advisors, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm on a, I'm a sand grain on a huge, enormous beach, but, but um, you know, I guess you, you, you have to stand for something, you know, or you'll fall for anything as that saying goes. And um, I've stopped doing, I mean, and truthfully, you can't really stop doing business with these companies because even, you know, you go to some fund company or some investment firm that that's not directly connected. They still own shares of all these companies. It's almost inextricable. You can't get them out of there. It's, they're, they're so tightly uh, woven together. Well, and you probably are aware of this. I happen to just, you know, it's, it's almost it's as much you learn from the companies that are signed on to this as industries that aren't. And, and I don't think I'm incorrect in saying there isn't a single major airline that's involved with this, which kind of leads to some of their other stuff about you'll, you'll, you know, rent everything. It'll be delivered to you by drone. And um, I think you, you're, you did an interview on geopolitics and empire. And, uh, it, and I, and I forget the host name, but he always talks about the algorithmic smart city ghetto or something like that, you know, where, where those of us settlements, I think is what the UN calls it. They call them settlements. I mean, that sounds appealing, but um so let me ask you, because you brought up a point, in addition to the UN, are there any other organizations or institutions like religion, you know, particularly large churches, you know, seem to kind of, they don't seem to appear to be involved. But I have to think that any organization that exhibits a great amount of control over, you know, its 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 members or its population would would I'd be, it'd be hard to imagine them not having some connection. Uh, well, the Catholic Church has... Uh, very, very deep connections with uh, this globalist agenda. Uh, they have basically signed on to this notion of stakeholder capitalism. They're entirely behind it. Uh, they believe that it's, it represents uh, the just operation of corporations and that uh, it represents the kind of wealth distribution that uh, the Pope, in particular, Francis, would like to see uh, underway. Uh, so you could, I would say, the Catholic Church, and then uh, where these other churches stand with reference to it, uh, mostly are compliant by default. They're not resisting this, and they're not trying to uh, alert anybody about it. In fact, they wouldn't probably think it would be at all problematic. Um, so yeah, there's a whole woke uh, Christianity that's developed. And uh, that has penetrated uh, most of the major denominations, frankly, leaving only uh, some outliers, frankly, uh, that have uh, resisted. Other than that, the other institutions, uh, the whole academia is entirely involved. Uh, they've already been involved in divesting from fossil fuels and other supposedly harmful uh, uh, carbon-based uh, energy products. Uh, so uh, you've got uh, the, of course, there are other groups that are feeding into this, their rhetoric and their uh, beliefs that have been, they've been building for years, like the Club of Rome. These all sound like conspiracies, even mentioning these groups. They exist and they do things. Uh, Club of Rome, the Bilderberg Group, uh, and... Uh, Basically, any climate activist group is involved. I have this thought that, you know, and I deal with, you know, I'm not, I, most of my clients are kind of, you know, the people have supposed, you know, lived their lives, worked hard, saved, done everything right. Yeah. 
you know, certainly people's lives have been affected in the last two years with the COVID and all that. But I don't know that the pain has gotten great enough. And so as we're kind of bringing this to up to it, because I'm going to put you on the spot as to where this is headed. But, you know, when I mean, to me, the high inflation gas prices, you know, I mean, the markets, you know, I'm not an economist, but I've been doing this long enough to know that it the movement doesn't make sense. You know, there's just a lot of things that don't make sense. And um, which has been good because it's helped me wake up, you know, and stop dealing with these companies. You know, I did a thing, just side note, one day I went on all these major money managers, you know, their websites, and every one of them has the CSG thing. I mean, it's almost like different colors, different graphics, but the same coordinated message. And, you know, that was eye opening. And so that's why I found guys like Alex Craner and Monaco and trend following and things that really remove some of that to the extent you can. But um, when do you think? This, this, you know, because more and more people are seeing it. But when do you really think? Is there a tipping point where all of a sudden this becomes reality, or is it? Does that just going to be too late? Oh, I think that the um, the gas price crisis is going to exacerbate this, and people are going to notice that these costs are due to divestment from fossil fuel producers, uh, oil companies. Uh, gas companies, uh, coal, and so forth, so that you're going to see, you know, energy prices continue to rise to the point of real serious pain, and people's lives, lifestyles will be affected dramatically, such that they'll have to uh, curtail other spending. And uh, then there's the possibility that you know, uh, the price of meats are going to be uh, exorbitant because these are supposedly, um, you know, uh, uh, cattle, for example, are, car uh, you know, uh, climate uh, change uh, gas producers, and also they consume a tremendous amount of energy. Yeah, the methane, they really make a big deal out of this. They're even putting masks over cows' mouths and faces to keep because they burp and, and they, uh, when they burp, they release some sort of gr greenhouse gases. So when this gets, we're seeing now with the farmers in uh, Switzerland, I think it is, or is it Switzerland? The farmers there in oh, Holland. Holland in revolt, uh, we're seeing, we're gonna see more of this and it's gonna start affecting food to the point where we may have shortages and also just exorbitant costs. Uh, and so then they're introducing already this idea of eating bugs for protein. And this is not, yeah, the kid, Nicole Kidman was just on uh, Vanity Fair. Uh, they did a video, Vanity Fair put out a uh, video of Nicole Kidman eating insects. Most of them so disgusting looking. I, I mean, I don't know how she stomached it. But basically playing Marie, Marie Antoinette saying, let them eat bugs. Look, I'll even eat some first. So all of this is going to reach a point where there's, the, the, there's, there's going to be, a lot, the tolerance level is going to peak. And uh, this will cause a huge backlash. And you know, Professor, it's not like these, it, you, you bring up a good point. It's not like people are hiding this. I mean, you got this uh, the CEO of Pfizer at the conference in 2018 talking about the electric pills and how um, the insurance companies can monitor whether you're taking your medication. And he talks about the applications of compliance. Then you've got this Julie Grant, who's the Australian e-safety commissioner. This just happened a month or two ago, talking about recalibrating human rights, including freedom of speech. Then you've got this gal, the, the, the famous one, the parliament in Denmark, Ida Alkin, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it, that talked about the oh, nothing. And then even, even, and this is the thing, you know, it's so easy to just pretend like these things all just don't connect. But then you have this Brian, this advisor, economic advisor to Joe Biden, Brian Deese, talking about, you know, they ask him how long are people going to have to suffer through high gas prices? Well, the future, of the, this is about, I'm quoting, this is about the future of the liberal world order. We have to stand firm. And of course, this guy was in charge of sustainability at BlackRock. So I, I don't know, you know, how, what, you know, what people need to realize that there's something going on here. Um, so let me ask you this, kind of like I said, I want to put you on the spot. Where do you think this goes? Well, 
everything is being incrementally introduced, and it, we're going to have a degree, you know, in, incremental increases in prices and uh, and technologies that are going to uh, continually being rolled out uh, that are going to uh, monitor, surveil, and uh, basically data tag every move you make and every uh, even your very thoughts, possibly. Uh, according to Yuval Harari, one of the advisors to Klaus Schwab. Um, I think that um, we're going to see a tipping point where, uh, whereby um, people uh, can't take it anymore. And then, you know, it could, it could uh, evolve into mass demonstrations. And ma like we're already seeing in Holland demonstrations from different sectors. But then it could become a mass, demonst mass demonstrations of people just suggesting that we know this is all being manipulated. This is not nature. This is not the economy's natural operations. This is all manipulated, and this is all about interventionism by the states and by these corporations as well, who are I consider to be part of the state, in effect. Uh, this is all being coordinated and manipulated, uh, and therefore, this could be changed, and, and therefore we're not taking it. And that's, that's where it could end. Okay, and so I have this, this idea, and I'm not a, a historian or, or you know, a guy who knows the Constitution, but I know, you know, it's always kicked, you know, it's pretty common knowledge that income taxes, federal income taxes are illegal, that the Congress is charged with an article, I got it written down here somewhere, one, Section 8 of the Constitution, you know, effectively gives Congress the responsibility, ascribes them responsibility to a fixed value to the currency. And so I have this, and then you're probably familiar uh, with uh, Harvey Bernard and Nassara, you know, and these ideas of, 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 of economic, I guess you'd call it monetary revolution. Um, I'm just curious if you have any idea, and I'm not a big guy that believes that everybody's debt gets paid off. That just doesn't make sense to me. But... What would you see, you know, I, I think we're, it's clear there has to be some kind of a, a sh this can't continue. You know, you can't just keep printing money and lowering rates. They'll, you know, that's kind of what I think's bubbling all this up. You know, yeah, I, and I'm just asking if you have any theories, just personal opinions that you're comfortable sharing that, about how this could shift to, you know, ultimately get us to a, a new a new way of, of operating economically. And Well, I think what's going to happen is the Great Reset is going to make very clear that this kind of interference in the market is disastrous. And this could have a big effect to actually rolling back even other social democratic or, you know, frankly, socialist policies that have been instituted. Uh, so that we, people are going to see the contrast because they're going to see the kinds of uh, effects of this kind of economic interventionism uh, and these effects are going to be so dramatic uh, that they may then see finally that the market, the free market, is the way to make wealth and distribute it, is the best mechanism for doing so, and that anything other than that really abrogates or uh, diminishes social welfare for everybody, not just the, not just the, uh, uh, the middle class, but also the poor. Uh, it actually exacerbates poverty and actually creates it. Um, so people are going to see that all these policies are creating the poverty that they're meant, supposedly meant to allay. And uh, that, will, that will strike people very clearly at, at some point. You know, one of my personal heroes is Robert Kennedy, and I've read just about everything there is to read about him. And, you know, he's held up as this this liberal icon, but, you know, the reality was, is he was the guy who was talking about, you know, you don't, welfare, all that does is replace the father in the home. I mean, they saw the evils of all this, and, and you know, of course, you see what happened to him. Um, any final thoughts, Professor? I just, I got to tell you, I started the introduction, and I, you know, I, and about how grateful I am that I, I've run across your work, because, again, there's a lot of extremes, you know, to this whole topic, and, and and I've always found your writing to be fair and educated and, and based on, on, you know, fact, you know, rather than just throwing things out. And um, any just final thoughts? Sure. A lot of that goes on. And this is what muddies the waters about this topic. Um, you get a lot of, uh, you know, unhinged opinion without actually investigating the actual material. I would say we can um, 
push legislators, if possible, to recognize what's going on and to stop this extra uh, legislative practice of instituting laws in effect without them being laws, technically speaking. That these are, these are breaches of property rights, uh, of the property rights of everybody, including stockholders, but also everybody else, consumers. Uh, this, is, this is a breach of our rights and that we didn't pay for that. We don't want to pay for this nonsense. This is putting enormous pressure on the economy. Uh, I would say practice the free market in your own life. Uh, try to keep the free market alive uh, through parallel structures, uh, economic and social structures of support and networking. Uh, this is not like leftist mobbing, but rather individuals networking together to keep free market principles alive. We may have to be the remnant for future generations, uh, if nothing else. Uh, and then also um, refuse the digital uh, CBDC, uh, central bank digital currency, refuse it. Refuse the digital identity, which is also coming down the line. Refuse the internet of bodies, which will put data tags on all of your organs and even possibly even your brain. Uh, refuse uh, all of these technologies that they're trying to introduce as a means of control, including the metaverse, which I think is another way of sort of placating people in a faux reality while they have nothing and are supposedly happy. Uh, in other words, the metaverse is a compensation for the fact that the real world is falling to hell in a handbasket. You know, it's funny, as the stuff becomes more of a reality and you start connecting the dots, you know, movies like The Surrogate, that, that's what you just described, where there's that, that woman's, you know, got the head, the thing on and she's just locked in some like coffin and she's living her life through this virtual thing. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I guess, you know, I, I again, appreciate your time. Um, and for anybody who thinks, you know, the bugs, all you got to do is go to the World Economic Forum and read some of the quotes from these people who are all in responsible positions throughout the world. Um, this is this. These are things people are saying. I mean, I, there was the other one about the clothes. You get your clothes have a a, a tracker so they can be recycled. And the other side of it is, of course, um, is you're being tracked. Your actions are being constantly monitored. And anyway, so um, I think awareness is is a good place to start. And again, I just appreciate your time, Professor. And I I, I, I will leave you with this that threat that I'll be reaching out to you again in the not so distant future. I've, yeah, I've got a lot more to say. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. And uh, I hope your audience stands firm and uh, stay strong. Emerson Fersh is a registered representative with and securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC, Advisor services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from Capital Investment Advisors. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. The guest speakers and the companies they represent are not affiliated with or endorsed by LPL Financial or Capital Investment Advisors. Individual tax and legal matters should be discussed with your tax or legal expert. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. There is no assurance that the techniques and strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. The purchase of certain securities may be required to affect some of the strategies. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal. 